Well, good morning. Welcome to Southeast Baptist Church Online. Uh, we're happy that you've joined us for a Bible study this morning, and uh, today we're going to begin a new Bible study uh, called After God's Own Heart, a fresh look at the Ten Commandments. You know, things like ethics, morals, right and wrong, these things have become so skewed in our world today that, that people want it seems to, to live on their own terms. But God has given us a clear path to follow through the Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, many people today see the Ten Commandments as a list of don'ts. When obeying the Ten Commandments leads to a rich and full life. So today, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments in a new light, in a different way. You know, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments down to just four words, love God and love others. You know, in, in this study, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments, and, and we're going to look at those not as a list of what not to do, but instead we're going to see these as, as if we obey the Ten Commandments, what do the Ten Commandments free us up to do? And what do they free us up to be in Christ? So along the way, we're going to take a look at David. Uh, you know, a man after God's own heart. David serves as the backdrop for a greater understanding of just how to live a life pleasing to God. So let's get started today. Uh, we're going to be reading from two passages in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles... I want to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read the first six verses in Exodus chapter 20. And then hold your finger over on Psalm chapter 16. So we'll be reading Exodus chapter 20 and Psalm chapter 16. Uh, let's begin uh, in Exodus chapter 20. And, and again, the title of today's lesson is Place God First. And the whole point of our lesson today is that when we place God first, every other aspect of our life falls into place. So let's kind of begin with a thought of just kind of asking ourselves a question. You know, have you ever felt disappointed or frustrated, hurt, confused? You know, the truth is, Every one of us have. Every one of us have been disappointed in life or frustrated with someone or something. We've been hurt. We've been confused. And, and life seems to be full of these issues. We've, if we ever feel like, like nothing is going right or, or that life has just not turned out like we've hoped, uh, you know, even though things aren't necessarily going our way, the solution is really simple. Uh, according to God's word. The solution is just to put God first and allow things to just to fall into place. When we focus on God and putting him first, everything else just seems to fall into place. I want you to open your Bibles up to Exodus chapter 20 and read along with me as we read Exodus 20 verses 1 through 6. Look at these verses with me. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You know, we're to put God first, because he alone is God. You know, God alone is perfect and holy. He's the creator of all things. He's all-knowing. And the question that we need to start with is, what does it look like when we place God first in our lives, in today's culture? You know, to put God first is to live a life punctuated 
by a love that stems from a spirit of gratitude. Many people who study the Ten Commandments, when they jump into the Ten Commandments, they, they skip the opening verses of Exodus 20. And it's important for us to note here that, that before God jumped into the Ten Commandments himself, he reminded the Israelites first of what he had done for them. And so I want to invite you to look with me at what God felt was important to remind the Israelites of. In verse 2, God says, uh, you know, I am the Lord your God. He's reminding the Israelites of who he is. Look at what he's saying here. You know, to the Israelites, God is saying, you know, that he is the God who made them. He knew them. He was aware of their sufferings. And, and he is the reason that, that he's, that's the reason he delivered them out of Egypt, out of slavery. You know, God is reminding them of what he has done for them. He's reminding them of his redemptive power, of the, of the power that has set them free. And it's their gratitude for what he has done for them that should be the foundation for putting him first in their lives. Not fear and not bondage, and certainly not a mandate to worship me or to, or to, or to put him first. You know, God is doing the very same thing for you and I today. You know, when God asks us to put him first, he's asking for our hearts because he knows our actions will follow. Whatever we give our hearts to, the rest of us falls in line behind that. And God is asking for the hearts of the Israelites. He's asking for our hearts. Look at verse 3. He says, no other gods besides him. You know, God is commanding, saying, you would have no other gods besides me. You know, this has to do with our motivation to serve and to obey God. You know, if we love others, you know, if we, if we have others beside, besides God, then, then, our, then our obedience, our motivation, our desires are, 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 are not solely his. God desires that we are, are solely his. And, and this is the, the idea behind this verse, that, that we're to have no one else besides him, that, that our focus is to only be on him. He doesn't want to share us. He doesn't want, want us to share him. It's, it's a chair that's only designed for him. And so we're to have no other gods beside him. Verses 4 and 5, as we look at these, he goes on, he says that we're to make no other idols and that, that we are certainly not to bow down and to worship them. You know, this is a command that God is giving the Israelites against idolatry, which was uh, common in their day. And God is calling his people out to be different than everyone else. And that is something that is, again, a word for you and I. God is calling us out to be different from those in the world today. He's asking us to look different, to be different. We're not to, we're not to blend in. As Christians, as believers, we are to stand out in a crowd. And that, as we stand out, we are to be more Christ-like. He goes on and God says that he is a jealous God. And the word jealous here is probably... It's probably better understood as zealous. You know, it speaks about God's love and his concern uh, for his people. He's a jealous God because he, he loves us so much, this concern for us. And so that zealous, he's zealous for us. He, it's that great love and concern that he has for you and I as believers. And, and he goes on and he, in verse 6, he begins talking about the consequence of sin. He says that, you know, that, that uh, for those of us that would, would turn away from him, uh, that their sin would impact not only their lives, but the lives of future generations. Um, but for those, uh, look at what it says, uh, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and who keep my commands. And so all of these opening verses are laying out the foundation and, and this remembrance 
for the Israelites. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done for you. Remember me. And as God begins to, to talk about these Ten Commandments, it's he begins not just jumping into the commandments, but he starts with, let me remind you who I am. I am your God. I am the one who hurt you. I am the one who saved you. I came after you. You were in slavery. And I set you free. I rescued you from slavery. I brought you out of slavery. I delivered you. And he reminds them of all of these things through these short few verses here. And, and it's, it's a powerful uh, picture for you and I today of, of being reminded of who we are and whose we are, and all the things that God has done for us. Now, turn over with me really quick uh, to Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, and let's take a look at, at these verses for a second. Look at what it says in Psalm 16, verses 1 through 4. David says here, Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones, in whom is all my delight, the sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. Now let's kind of stop right there and take a look at, at what David is saying here. David when he says here that he has no good besides God is, you know, David's not really saying that he doesn't have anything that's any good. What David is really focusing on here is instead, you know, David is saying that, that, that God alone is good. So anything that is good is from God. It's, it's as though God, he, David is saying, you know, everything that I have that is good, the source of it, is God, is the source of all things that are good comes from God. And if it isn't good, then it doesn't come from God. So remember with me that, that there's a deceiver among us who, who seeks to use things to, to plant doubt in our hearts uh, concerning God's goodness. You know, the devil wants to focus on our pain. He wants us to focus on our pain. If we can focus on our trials and our difficulties, then, then Satan can, can begin to plant doubts in our minds and in our hearts about the goodness of God. And he can begin to tempt us and help us to develop uh, what so many today have, which is this victim's mentality. Remember Job? You know, Job, Job had everything taken from him. Satan killed and destroyed all who Job loved and cherished. But Job remained steadfast and trusted in the goodness of God. You know, if, if something is good, then the source, according to David, is, is God. But if something doesn't seem good, then the source may still be God. Now follow this with me. You know, if something doesn't seem good, just because it doesn't seem good doesn't mean that God can't use that in our lives. Sometimes God allows things into our lives that isn't good. And why he does that, I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes God God just does what he does. He allows those things in uh, to help us to become more like Christ. One of the things I learned a long time ago that a, that a pastor uh, was preaching and it was so eye-opening was you know God cares more about who we become than who we are and if and if that means that 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 we have to go through some trials and tribulations or some troubles or maybe that that some 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 bad things have to come in to our life or even like Job where God allows some bad things to happen to us God is concerned about who we become on the backside, on the end of, the, of a process, that we become more like Christ. Now, if something doesn't seem good, um, the source may still be God. Even if we encounter something that truly isn't good, 
If, it, if we encounter something that's evil, it can still cause us to recognize the goodness of God all the more because, again, if we encounter pure evil, then if we come in the face of pure evil, we can be even more grateful for, for God and for the goodness of God in the, in the sight of evil. Because again, there we can see God and the purity of God with all of that. Now, as David is looking here um, at this in this passage, he says, preserve me, O God. I take refuge in you. You know, and he said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good beside you. As for the saints who are on the earth, there are the they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. And then look down at verse uh, 9 through 11 with me. It says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Now it makes a lot of sense that, that we're, we're to prioritize what's important in our lives. You know, David emphasized that God is to be first in our lives because he alone deserves our worship. And God alone can provide for us. He gives us life. He even gives us eternal life if we would choose Christ. You know, God isn't one of the ways. He is the only way that leads to abundant joy in this life and for eternity. Eternal life is the gift that you and I receive when we place our faith in Christ alone for the payment of our sins. You know, what has God done recently that has made you glad and led you to rejoice? Think about that for a minute. What has God done recently that has led you and made you glad and led you to rejoice? You know, the Ten Commandments were never given as an entry point for eternity. God wants us to obey them. But the ultimate purpose of the law was to show us our inability to keep those laws. In other words, you and I cannot keep all Ten Commandments all the time without Christ. So the Ten Commandments really reveal our need for a Savior. Now, you know, one of the things that this Sunday School lesson today um, does that, 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 that I personally don't prefer and that, that we um, struggle with at times is jumping around and, you know, jumping from this passage to that passage. And, uh, you know, if you look at where we started in, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, this, these first few verses really are God just setting up the Ten Commandments and God walking in and saying, let me remind you of who I am. And God telling the Israelites, before you do anything, before, you, before I give you the law, before I give you the commandments, these Ten Commandments that you're to keep, let me remind you who I am. Let me remind you of what I have done for you. You know, I told you when we began that, that, that God wanted us, God wants us to put him first in our lives. And that's the whole point of today's lesson, is that we're to put God first and foremost. We're not to follow God and, and put God first because there's a list of rules that we're to keep, like the Ten Commandments. We're not to put God first out of fear or, or afraid that, that he's going to drop the hammer on us, um, you know, afraid that, that there's going to be a punishment. 
We're to, we're to put God first because of all that God has done for us. You know, God has allowed Jesus Christ to be our substitute for the punishment of sin. And each of us deserves each of us deserves that punishment. Each of us deserves the punishment for our sin, but Christ took that punishment on. Now, does this mean that we can ignore the Ten Commandments or ignore God's commands and live any way we want? Absolutely not. You know, just because we have been forgiven and just because Christ has taken on our sin doesn't mean that we have a blank check to live any way we want. But it does mean that as believers, you and I have been set free from legalism. We have been set free from condemnation through salvation in Jesus Christ. And now, you and I can pursue a life pleasing to God by placing Him first in our lives over everything else because of all that He has done for us. So we're to put God first. We're to put God first and have no other gods beside Him, as David said. We're not to have any other idols. We're not to put jobs or money or the pursuit of money or, or, or the pursuit of a goal. We're not to have any other idols before God. No other gods before Him. And then as, as verse 16, I mean as Psalm 16, uh, verses 9 through 11, where David says that my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, my flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow my whole your Holy One to undergo decay, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. When we put God first, He will reveal His path to us. He will, it, he will shine a light. He'll, he'll turn on the light. He opens up this doorway that sometimes we didn't even see was there. And that's something that's so important to us, that, that if we just put God first, everything else falls into place. This is the one action that affects everything else in our life. So as we begin this new study, looking at the Ten Commandments in a whole fresh new way, I want to encourage you this week to genuinely think about what God has done for you. What has He done for you? And focus on putting God first in your life, above everything else. Let's pray. God, thank You for, putting, uh, for, for providing for us. Thank You for uh, saving us. And thank You for giving us everything that we need. God, thank You for all that You have done. And I pray, Lord, that, that as we go throughout this week, that You would help us to truly learn what it means to put you first in our lives. And Father, I pray that as we put you first, that we would learn to live a life that is pleasing to you. That we would allow you to guide us, to lead us, and to direct us. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask you to lead us this, this week to help us to live for you. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. Hope you guys have a great week. We look forward to, uh, to, to worshiping with you here in just a little while. You guys take care.